Hello, everybody. Welcome to Work Ready, Find a Job if you're 50 plus. My name is Ole Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for LA County Library. Work Ready has been running from December of last year and is going to be running to December of this year. And the program's purpose is to help those affected by COVID either get a job or improve your current work situation. And by improve your current work situation, I mean get a promotion or just plan a more sustainable career path. And we're helping you do that in three ways. First, we're helping to battle the digital divide by lending out laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots. So you get a computer and access to the internet for that computer and up to nine other devices. And we're lending those out of 20 library locations for six week periods. So you go on our website, lacountylibrary.org, click work ready, it should be right in the middle there. Fill out a form, you choose which libraries you want to pick up your, your laptop at. We sent you an email with all the instructions to come pick up the laptop, you have that laptop for six weeks, no questions asked. The second way work ready is helping is by doing events like this about all sorts of work related topics. Now today's event is find a job if you're 50 plus, but we have events about resumes, cover letters, interviewing, and many, many other work related topics. And the third way we're helping out is by buying the latest and greatest work related books, audiobooks, ebooks. So no matter how you want to access the materials, whether you want to put it on hold on our website and go to the library and pick it up, or you just want to go to our website, click on Overdrive, and look at the book right here on your computer without leaving your chair. You can do that. We've got books on any work-related topic you can think of and many skills to boot. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for today. Carrie Hannon is a leading expert and strategist on work and jobs, entrepreneurship, personal finance, and retirement. Carrie is the author of more than a dozen books, I think it's 17 or something like that, including Great Pajama Jobs, Your Complete Guide to Working from Home, Never Too Old to Get Rich, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Starting a Business Midlife, Great Jobs for Everyone 50 Plus, and Money Confidence. She's a frequent keynote speaker and TV and radio commentator. She's also an ex expert columnist and regular contributor to the New York Times, Market Watch, Forbes, and the PBS website, nextavenue.org. Carrie's latest book, which she'll be telling you a little bit about, is In Control at 50 Plus, How to Succeed in the New World of Work, which will be published by McGraw-Hill in November of 2021, so later on this year. Carrie lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and documentary producer and editor, Cliff Hackle, and her Labrador retriever, Zena. If you'd like to contact Carrie, her website is CarrieHannon.com. You can reach her on Twitter, at Carrie Hannon, and she's also on LinkedIn. You just type in her name, Carrie Hannon, and you should be able to find her. All right, enough introductions. I'm going to turn it over to Carrie, and uh, she's going to tell you about how to find a job if you're 50 plus. Go ahead, Carrie, you're on. Good morning, everyone. It is terrific to be here. Oleg, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, you know, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, um, this is what I've been working on for, for quite a long time, focusing on how do we harness the experience that we have to really land jobs that we love and jobs where the employers value us and our time? And so uh, anything I can do to sort of inspire you, um, I'm here. Please reach out after the program if you have any further questions. But I'm just going to give a quick sort of tableau look at what we're seeing coming out of the pandemic, which, of course, we're still involved with, but after 2020, which was a heck of a year, and looking at where sort of the work platform is today, where the work environment might be going and how the 50 plus worker can fit into this. Um, and so I'm gonna give you just sort of what I see as the big trends 
coming out of this period of time. And then open it up to questions. And I want to talk about what you need to know and anything I can contribute to that. So, so just to sort of back up a little bit, what a year, right? Um, so many jobs were lost last year and older workers over 50 were slammed uh, particularly hard uh, and women even more so uh, for several reasons. But um, we had small businesses, many uh, with entrepreneurs over the age of 45 or 50 really were shattered. I mean, it was just one thing after another, which everyone sort of, we rushed, we got home, we sort of battened down the hatches. Um, so if it wasn't a job loss, maybe you had an employer that was, you know, quickly trying to pare down rosters and offering early retirement packages, which are tempting, enticing. But frankly, uh, we know that work is a pillar of a good retirement plan, right? It's you've got your savings, perhaps your retirement savings, Social Security. But my goodness, work in some fashion is usually going to help you with, you know, your financial security. So even if you took an early retirement or you stepped away from the workplace last year, uh, work is still in your mind. It is something you're going to want to have even part time in some way. So I think that work is uh, the word retire always seems to me uh, an outdated word uh, in this generation. And with the longevity we have moving forward, it, it really needs to be a part of our thinking. So there's all kinds of ways that the culture needs to change and we can talk about ageism, which is so pervasive for workers over 50 as we move into our discussion this morning. But let me tell you what I see coming out. So we had these these really uh, shattering events uh, that changed all the way we look at our work. And uh, many of us, uh, and certainly I did, paused and gave us this chance to really consider what it is that work, what role does work play in our lives? And if you were lucky to continue with the job that you had, you may have found yourself terribly burned out, unable to draw those life work boundaries as you desperately ramped up the tech skills to do your work online and collaborate online, which we all did quite successfully. I'm, I'm sure uh, this isn't uh, that hard uh, to do. It just takes repetition. But but it was a moment in time where people it gave you pause to reconsider what's what what means to you what you need in your life moving forward. So if you're looking for a job right now, I want you to really think deeply about those questions. You know what about what motivates you, what what you'd like to get out of work, and what kind of company it is that really um, that you admire whose mission, whether it's a nonprofit or a business that are doing a product or a service that really, hey, you know, that's something that you can get behind. This is your time to do that. But the big trends that came that are coming out of the pandemic are these. Number one, and this is no surprise, remote work is here to stay, okay? It was always, you know, on the fringes and something that was a perk. It was a nice thing, particularly uh, at a certain age where you can maybe get your boss to agree to let you flex time, work a little bit from home back and forth. But it was employee by employee, employee sort of um, deal. But after last year, companies realized, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. This thing actually works. I mean, people were productive and things got done and it was a cost saver for employers. So the number one trend is that remote work isn't going away. In fact, uh, some of the big job boards have seen, you know, three times the number of job postings for remote work than uh, pre-pandemic. I mean, it's just they're, they're more and more out there in all kinds of fields. And so the opportunities are there. I mean, ultimately, I think you're going to have a hybrid uh, situation where employers want you in the office a little bit. Working from home remote is OK as well, but the point is remote work is here to stay. And I think that this is a fabulous trend for workers over 50 for several reasons. And the number one reason is what I just mentioned a few minutes ago, this per pervasive ageist uh, mentality that exists in our workplaces. I mean, certainly it exists in our culture in general, but in the workplace, you know, companies will say, oh, no, 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 we, we don't have a problem with that. But 
In fact, you know, older workers get passed over all the time for promotions and, you know, you get right down to the end of a job uh, search and maybe it's you and someone else. And it's, it's as if they see your expiration date. Um, so I think that this ageism bit is, is really quite, quite something we need to tackle, but where remote work comes in handy is that if we see this trend continues, why it's positive is that when you're not working side by side with someone a couple of decades younger than you, it's not as a parent, your age is not as front and center. So you're not judged on your cover, so to speak, whether it's gray hairs or your skin isn't quite as, you know, fresh and taut or what have you, but you're judged on your performance, on your productivity. And these are things that are really key and critical. And I think employers see this with the older workers they had with them, the experience, uh, they valued uh, during a, a period of quite a bit of shift last year. And so remote work really can help in that respect. I think if you have a disability of any kind, uh, most people step out of the workplace. They say they're not going to retire until way past 65, but they tend to step away sooner because of a health issue. And so what happens is if you have some kind of a disability that makes um, it difficult to commute and like for myself, I have really bad night vision and I hate having to work late and having to drive home in the dark. So the ability to work remotely can just in, in subtle ways in little ways makes it easier to find work that doesn't uh, require you to make these sort of arduous commutes or have a work office environment that maybe isn't quite as conducive to dealing with whatever issue, health issue might you might be uh, dealing with. So I think in those two respects, remote work is super positive and opens up the doors to lots of different kinds of work that might not have been available uh, previously. This, the second big trend I see coming out of the pandemic is entrepreneurship for older entrepreneurs. Now, I've written a book about this. This is not new in the sense that people over 50 have been starting businesses at a quicker clip than people in their 20s and 30s for a number of years now. But uh, the Kaufman Foundation, who really pays attention to all of this, saw a particular uptick in older entrepreneurs in 2020. And there are a couple of reasons for this. I think uh, folks that, that stepped out of the workplace, lost a job or took an early retirement, perhaps um, were frustrated with the job trying to get back in and decided, you know what, this is my time to be my own boss, to do my own thing, something I've always wanted to do. But it also is because of the way the world is now with the ability to work from our computers, our laptops, our home offices, the technology is there. You can hire virtual workers, virtual assistants. You don't need brick and mortar or a full staff of people to help you. You can hire someone to pop in and help you with the books, bookkeeping or with marketing, sales, whatever it might be. The virtual workforce, as you may be one of them, is here, is here and willing to take on and they don't have to live in your town. They can live across the country. So an entrepreneurship doesn't have to be a, a huge financial commitment. If you have a dream, a business plan, you honestly know, you know, you've asked those questions. My, why me? Why now? You know, why this kind of business or this service or this product? And really know that you have a market for this. But there are ways to get started on the side even that entrepreneurship is a reality. It is often a solution for workers over 50 today. As I said, even if you're starting it on the side, if you're still looking for that full-time job, great. Um, but again, this is, I see this percolating up and it's work that can go, you know, carry you through a number of years. And um, that's very exciting to me. The, the third big uh, trend that's coming out of this, which I love as well is, People are, when we talked earlier, I, I mentioned earlier this time this past year when we were at home and under lockdown or what have you, that you did that soul searching about, you know, what is meaningful to you? What matters? Um, people are changing careers. This used to be a huge um, situation like, oh my gosh, you're switching careers. I mean, do you know what you're getting into? Do you really have enough runway to do that? I mean, it takes time to shift and make a career transition. It does not happen overnight. There's lots of things you need to put in place before you can do that, which we can talk about later in the 
Q and A if you want to. Um, but but it is something that people say, hey, you know what? That is what I want to do. I realize I'm not going to replicate that old job I had. It's not coming back the way it was previously. And it's not about people are realizing it's not reinventing themselves. It's really. And I, I like to look at it this way that you're redeploying your skills. You're really doing that, you know, in our MRI about what are your core skills? What are you really good at? And what do you really love to do? And finding a way to pivot those to a new field. But you're not completely reinventing yourself. You're doing, you know, using those skills that you've honed for years and shifting them to a new environment where hopefully there's more opportunity for you, not only personally. Uh, to get engaged with your work again and love what you're doing, but they're actually job growth. And 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 to be honest, coming, you know, we looked at the numbers, the economic numbers right now, and and you know, the job market has come back. Uh, a number of over fifty workers clearly are still on the sidelines, and I'm sure many of you are, uh, or you wouldn't be here listening to me talk about finding a great job over fifty. But in fact, the jobs are there. People, can, you know, employers are saying they're just not finding. The right skill sets in some of these employers and wages have bumped up a little bit. And so there, there's movement afoot. That's a positive thing. But, but I think the idea of transitioning to new areas of work is really getting the bandwidth and people are saying it's not so scary and let's give this a try. And I really. Uh, I encourage you all to think about ways that, you know, it, what are the clues to what you did before the clues to what you want to do in the future that will really uh, make a difference in your life and maybe in those around you. The other trend, uh, the fourth, uh, I guess, the, actually, we've done remote work, entrepreneurship, career transition. The fourth area I see coming up now, this is a little bit. This worries me a little bit, and it, it might not worry all of you because it depends on if you're looking for part time work or full time work or whether you're 50 to 60 or 60 to 70 and you need benefits. But what what is coming out of this last year is that workers. Yeah, employers are hiring. They're looking for workers. There is this uptick there. Remote work has taken front and center. Uh, and as I said, the genie's out of the bottle, but these are contract positions. If you look at a lot of the job postings, they're not necessarily full time positions. They're looking for someone to do a project. They're looking for six months. It's, you know, so you end up cobbling together a bunch of contract assignments, which could could be fantastic for you. It could be exactly what you want right now. But the danger in that for workers over 50, if you do need those benefits, if you do need the you know, the bolstering of having an employer provider retirement plan to help you save for retirement, or you need those health benefits. Um, this is kind of a dangerous trend and something to pay attention to because it does put the onus back on on the individual to be self-employed because if you're a contract worker, essentially it is up to you to do these things and essential with longevity in order to have financial security as we age. And so that trend I do find a bit worrisome and something to pay attention to. So on one hand, it's positive because we're seeing more job opportunities. On the other, employers are saying, hey, we can really cut costs by not bringing you on full steam. So that's the other one. And the final trend, which really benefits everyone, is lifelong learning is no longer something that oh isn't that nice you know I, I think i'll take a course here i'll go to the community college and and take this class because it interests me what is happening now and because of the uh, being home and in the pandemic the number of offerings for education online has just skyrocketed and these are you know we did have some of these starting up prior to that with coursera and um, you know, some of these sort of online from the big universities offering free courses online. Um, some were for pay, of course, but this opportunity to learn had started to percolate up. But today there's so many opportunities to go and add to your skill set to really put another quiver, uh, <laughs> another arrow in your quiver, so to speak, and really build your skill set. And I think a lot of workers over 50 
who were out of work during the pandemic did exactly that. I think we all realized that, hey, you know what, this is time to reskill a bit. But now it's no longer a, a one off kind of thing. This is here to stay because we're realizing that our working lives have been extended. And because of the opportunity for virtual education, we can do this. We can stay relevant in our jobs and stay current in the skills that are needed for the jobs that we're looking for by these opportunities. Even what we're doing here today, having this wonderful uh, workshop and conversation, this wouldn't have been possible a number of years ago in the same way that we can all come together to learn new things and to share and to help each other um, find new work and find possibilities. But the idea that education is finally getting to an area that it's quality and it's things that we can learn online. Yeah, I, like everyone else, love the opportunity of going to a classroom and engaging face to face with people. But, but I find that, you know, in the last year, I ramped up my skill set as well. And there's a big study I, I saw this past week that showed that hiring managers who uh, really have sort of got, you know, I'm a little leery about hiring somebody and let's say it's over 45, I think was the number they used in this study. Um, when they saw that that someone had added more education, they had added a skill set uh, that they had retrained in some way, this started to change their thinking. This said, you know what, I'm more open to looking at that individual because not only do you show that you're willing to learn new ways of doing things, to learn new technology, which is, oh my gosh, you know, that's one of the big myths of the older worker, which I hope to get into a little bit more in the Q&A section about what the big, the big myths are and how the business case for hiring all of us is, because, um, you know, I'm a contract worker myself. I'm out there hustling for jobs uh, just as many of you are. And so I have faced ageism. I've worked with younger editors. I'm constantly trying to uh, hone my skills so that I'm still relevant and on top of my field. And so this education piece is huge. And I think that's a big trend we see coming out of this. And I think it benefits workers over 50. So, you know, to kind of pause there, those are the big picture trends I see coming out of the past year. And, you know, frankly, I'm hopeful, but, you know, I tend to be that kind of individual. I kind of, you know, see, um, you know, I'm kind of this upbeat look on things because I think that's how you succeed is by, you know, being optimistic by being positive. I mean, it's not that I have my head in the sand. I totally get the ageism piece. I understand how it's like a brick wall getting through to employers, uh, particularly when you're applying online to jobs. So there's all kinds of ways that I, I'd like to talk to you about that we can talk about, you know, when you get into an interview, how to really showcase who you are, uh, how to get your resume ready so that it gets through some of those uh, those virtual uh, leaps and bounds it has to. And the importance of networking, let's face it, um, if you followed my work, you've heard this before, I always say that networking is one letter away from not working. And though all of us are like, no, 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 stop. I hate that word networking. The fact is, it's, it is how you get a job. I mean, employers hire the way they always have. They hire people they know or people they know know. They want a trusted individual. They want someone to kind of say he or she is okay. I give them, it doesn't mean you're going to get the job, but that's what gets you in the door is often it's who you know. And so no matter all the great job boards that have come up and we can talk about some of those for flexible work, for remote work, um, there's lots of great ones now. Um, it really does come down to that personal connection. It's who do you know? And that is all about networking. So um, I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to turn it over to Oleg and let let it loose. Whatever you think this audience would love to learn about, let's let's get the conversation going. Sure. Well, you had already started with uh, with networking, <laughs> and I, I think that's a great place to start because that's something that so many people are afraid of. Um, people might think, you know, okay, there's everybody's sort of feeling like they're starting at zero. Like, I don't know anyone in this field, or I don't know anyone who knows anyone who can help me get a job. Uh, where, what do you say to somebody who feels like they don't know anyone? And also, I mean, let's, uh, let, as, as sort of tangent that uh, adjacent question is, how about for people who feel awkward about reaching out to, 
you know, some maybe they haven't spoken to in a while, or just even a close friend who they feel awkward reaching out to asking for help. Um, what do you, what do you, well, let's, let's start with a, I don't know anyone. <laughs> well, you do. That's the thing is you actually really do know people, but the, the point is there's this fear. I, I honestly think when you're at this age group that you kind of, and, and I, excuse me if I use this a little flippantly, but it's the, you know, it's embarrassing to be looking for a job and, you know, you don't want to tell people that you're out of work or you asking for help is probably the hardest thing that we have to do. And you really have to get over that because you have to tell everybody, you know, uh, your circle of friends, your family, uh, keep moving it out. The people in, you know, maybe, uh, any group you have, I'm a big fan of alumni groups. If you have any, your high school, your college, whatever it might be, your community group, um, kid, your kids, friends. I know somebody who recently got a job because his son's friend was over for dinner and said, what are you, you know, what are you doing, Mr. So-and-so? And he said, well, I'm looking for a job doing X. And he said, well, you should talk to my mom. Well, he had never thought to talk to this kid's mom because he had no idea what she did even. That woman, she didn't give him a job, but she connected him to somebody else. So it's these unlikely connections, but the, the really obvious ways is to get on, if you do have an alumni group, uh, that you can get on the, a virtual uh, connection. LinkedIn often has these alumni groups or Facebook might, or, you know, go to some of these uh, electronic connections, these virtual connections and see how you do the scan. If you're on LinkedIn and not everyone is, but I honestly, if you're looking for a white collar job, particular, uh, particularly, um, this is where you need to be. And if you get your profile put up and so forth, you can look for uh, who you know at companies you might like. And surprisingly, you'll find connections that may be a few off, but there are people you do know. But I think, you know, like the biggest piece is getting over that fear of asking for help and being, you know, too cool for school, like not like, hey, you know, I'm OK, you know, I'm OK, I don't need, you know, but you have to just pull back those layers and be vulnerable, allow yourself to be vulnerable and say, can you help me? Do you know anybody here? The other uh, way to go about this, too, is if you can get on some of these uh, job board, I mean, LinkedIn industry groups or uh, in your hometown, if there's some sort of, uh, if you're interested in starting a business, even a small business, uh, if there's a economic development group that may be, or a rotary club, that some of these meetings may be virtual right now, of course, but if there's a way that you can, you know, listen to a speaker and send them a note and say, I'd like to link in with you if they've talked about an industry that you're interested in, I got to tell you, people are extremely flattered by this. I mean, they really go, oh, wow, yeah, of course I can give you a few. You're not asking that person for a job. You're asking them about their job. And we all love to talk about our work. And believe me, they'll try to connect you to somebody else. And the ball gets rolling. So, Carrie, what is in that situation? You're contacting a, a total stranger, essentially. Um, what do you, I mean, what's a, what's a helpful script? Um, for that, like, what do you say? What, what do you write? Yeah, I mean, that, it is a little bit tricky. Um, and you have to say, you acknowledge that up front, you know, um, but you need to find a, a way in and a way in is that you've heard them speak or a friend recommended them to you as somebody who really knows this field or you read, you know, somehow you learned about how did you learn about them? You need to just tell them and say, you know, I know your time is really, you know, valuable to you. I just. Would love to have a few minutes of your time if you could um, set it up, give it a time limit, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And during that time, if you can get them to agree to speak to you, but it's best to find, even if you can go look at their LinkedIn profile and find out, like if someone went to mine, I'm not sure, but I think you might find out that I love horses and dogs. Okay, just say something about a horse or a dog and I'll probably be happy to connect with you. But if you do, give it a time, a finite period, have good questions and it's not about you. This is not your time to sell who you are at all. You are asking them about them. So everything has to be like, I think of a picture of my dog looking up at me with these loving, adoring eyes because I have a treat in my hand. I mean, that's the kind of thing you want to be looking up at whoever you're talking to fully focused on them and find out, you know, what, you know, how they got their job or what, 
what they see as the trends in their industry or where the job opportunities might be. I know this is scary stuff, but truthfully, people love to talk about the work and we all really do like to help each other out. Just don't uh, don't make it a big ask, you know, make it just a small one. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And somebody mentioned in the comments. Um, it was in the Q and a about being of service and I know that that that's something that you actually have in your book. Um, yeah. in, in the area, and can you talk a little bit more about how that might fit into into networking? Yeah, I think this is what you're referring to is this is 1 of my favorite tips for. Workers uh, over 50 who are looking for something and just sitting at home firing off these resumes and not hearing anything back this black hole and it's so rejection is so depressing. I say, get out of your head and get into the world. Anything you can do, you know, to volunteer and, and this is a fit. It's like a magic ingredient that people overlook because in today's world, okay, you might have to be doing some of this virtually, but if you can do it physically, it's great, but it's finding ways to use your skill set. So we're looking at skills based volunteer projects, things you can do using things that you do well, maybe it's sales or marketing or project management, ways that you can take the things you do in the workplace, but you know, give your time and your expertise to an organization. And what happens with that is, first of all, you feel great. I mean, it's really nice to do things for other people and organizations and mission that have missions that you value and care about. So you get this internal sense of feedback, of feeling better about who you are. And secondly, you are meeting people who uh, might know somebody. So you're expanding that network, right? You're finding people who may say, hey, you know what? You might wanna talk to so-and-so over here. So again, you're telling people you're looking for work as well, and there might even be a job opportunity right there. Of, you know, you not, might not know it immediately, but these things often do grow into uh, some sort of work, paid work. So, you know, I think volunteering is a really magic way to stay current, to stay involved with people and not sink into sort of the depression that can come from job hunting. Also, and, oh, one other yeah. thing is it looks great on your resume <laughs> because it shows that you don't, like if you have this gap in employment, you have something you're doing and, and phrase it on your resume in a work term. I mean, don't, you know, you wanna put down that you were project managing or you were fundraising or you were doing marketing or sales, just like it, a job a description, you know, use it. So let's let's move to something slightly adjacent to networking, and that is we, we had a question from a Patty. She said, "My skills are widespread. How do I zero in on a specific position or discipline?" She said, "I'm a trained journalist who has also worked in nonprofit, in marketing, and at elementary school and communications. Um, so she'd like to work as an organizational assistant or administrative assistant. But really, I, I think it's a more general question for a lot of people. You know, people have worked at this and this and this. How do you sort of figure out which skills to lean on when looking for a job? Oh, that, uh, Patty, that is an awesome question because I think at this point in our lives, a lot of us have so many things we can do. Um, the point, what you need to do, and, and this is a bit of an exercise, uh, but you have to get really clear with yourself and say, and this is a sort of a, Big question, but I, 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 uh, I've learned this from, from a, a wonderful career coach uh, if, uh, named Steve Dalton. And he said, ask yourself, what is the one skill that you are the best at? What are you better than most people at? And, and, and answer it fast, like right away, right off the top of your head. What is the thing that you're best at? And, and chances are, that's what you want to be doing. That's the skill you want to use the most. So um, that it helps you kind of give your North Star to give some direction. But but again, you can expand that say, what are the, my major skills? And some of us don't even know what those are. You might ask people around you about what they think you're best at, because often you take those things for granted uh, of what you're truly skilled at. And so once you have sort of that working list, and, and it sounds like, Patty, you have that already, who do you want to work for? I mean, this is a two-way street. Hiring's not all about them, uh, an employer, like, giving the big, yes, you can come work for us. It's about who do you want to work for? So think about what companies, what nonprofits that you value, that that you want to be part of their team, that it would really um, be a place that would be fantastic for you to be a part of. Then that hones you down 
to what what employers you might want to look at and then let's go see what jobs they have open and what skills you have that might fit into those kinds of jobs i think that's a backwards way of getting at it but it you can't be scattershot i think it's very clear be very clear about what you're really great at and then when you're in an interview situation, when someone looks at who you are, they'll see the full person. But try to be, you know, don't be a little of this, a little of that, because no one, no, an employer wants to know how you can solve their problem today. So they're looking for a really certain skill set. You know, someone's a great communicator or they're a great salesperson. They want that today. So I have a quick question here for you. Um, and maybe, maybe actually, maybe this is more than a quick question because you might have some insight on it. Uh, when looking for a job, this is a question from Sandra. When looking for a job, should we look at companies' websites instead of a, a job board or a job listing site like Indeed? Oh my gosh, I get in trouble for this one. Here's the thing. <laughs> I love job boards in the sense that, and there's some great ones out there, right? Indeed's wonderful. I love Flex Jobs is one of my favorite sites. Um, and um, Wave is another one I like for uh, experienced workers. There's some others in my book, Pajama Jobs, or I can send you a list of ones I love. But here's the thing about job boards. Um, there's all kinds of caveats. There are a lot of these that the jobs may be posted, but they maybe have already been filled. Thousands of applications come flying in for these postings. Uh, it's hard, you get lost in the shuffle. To me, and, and I'm not saying that you can't find success on a job board, but many people do, but most people don't. Most, and, and that's every, I mean, when I canvass all the, I've interviewed thousands of, of workers in our age cohort, most people find jobs uh, not on the job board itself. They may hear of a job, they may see of a job posting there. It's a great place to look and say, oh my gosh, what skills do I need? These are the jobs that are people are looking for. Do I have the skill set? What are the qualifications? And if you don't, this is the time to tap into that education I was talking about because you want to have the whole, whole package coming forward. But so to your question, yes, I think they're great for your research. They're great for your homework. They're great for figuring out what uh, skills you need. But I honestly think that company website going directly to the company or going to someone you know at that company who might have heard of an opening, that's your best way in the door because it's just the field is a little narrower or looking for really niche job boards, job boards that are specifically in your industry and might just have a little tighter universe because of the big ones, you know, and, and you know, the, at, when those go through, those resumes go through the virtual thing, they're looked at in maybe six seconds and most of them are reviewed by a computer. So you're really better off if you can get straight into the company and actually figure out who's going to be looking at that at that resume. Mm -hmm. That sounds that sounds about right. Yeah, it's uh, uh, that create that connection. So uh, I have a question about something that comes up in almost all of our programs, and that is uh, employment gap. Whether somebody was taking care of kids, taking care of older parents, uh, had an illness, their resume has a sizable hole and many people lack the confidence or not sure or feel like it's going to hurt them. How do people address a gap in their resume? Yeah, you are correct. That is huge. And uh, this is, as a, uh, you know, clearly this is, care, to me, caregiving is a big one here, but it's also uh, the challenge of finding work over 50. We've got a lot of uh, long-term unemployed people are employed over six months. Um, this this is a sticky point because the longer you're out of work, the harder it is to get work. It's you know this really bad cycle. Um, the best things to do in this situation is, as we talked about a few minutes ago, if you can find a way to, you may have that gap from paid employment, but if you've been able to, in some way, do volunteer work along the way, if it is caregiving for a child, if it's you know a woman or a man who's been out doing child rearing caregiving duties. Um, you may have been involved in the school in some way, you know, running fundraising efforts or various ways you were working uh, in through different uh, activities that your child was involved in. Think of those, re repurpose those in a way that have, uh, you know, sort of a business uh, tone to them so that you can, it may take you a little time to regroup and how do I show this as experience, but 
in and, and in your resume you say you know related experience or something along those lines relevant experience you like don't have to uh, put it right up in the main part of your resume, but I think that gap, you can explain it away. Most people understand if it's caregiving and it today in today's world. Also, a big piece of that is elder caregiving. So taking care of our parents. A lot of us, I know, especially during the pandemic, I personally uh, was caring for my 91 year old mom. It was super hard to work. I work for myself, so I, I managed to make it work. But if I had been with an employer, it put, could have been pretty difficult uh, if I had to keep strict hours. So. Uh, in that case, I would have had to find a way to rephrase that. So, if you've been out for caregiving for an, uh, an elder relative or a parent or even a spouse or a partner, um, how can you rephrase that? Were you a project manager? You were a patient advocate, perhaps. You were a financial manager. There are a lot of duties you do when you're caregiving that have business implications. And so, you need to play up how your skills were used in those areas. So, the two things are volunteer if you can find skill based ways to to massage that into work terminology or specifically you know what you were doing during that time that and oh the third piece of that uh also is education or training anything you did during that time like i took that time i was caregiving but i was also i took this class or i traveled or not the past year, but you know what I'm saying <laughs> to show that you didn't that you were engaged in the world that you were engaged in learning Actually, something related, uh, uh, Sandra says, for employment gap, can we say we retired and then decided to go back to work? Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a creative that, way to address that. that. Is, you know, it, that is exactly what I think is going to be happening post pandemic. I mean, I do think a lot of us burned out people, maybe took early retirements even now or lost their job in the last year or so are going to say, OK, I just need to back off and take a breath. And OK, I am retired now, but you're going to discover down the road that, you, you know what? I still have more to give. I have more to do. I still I want the financial safety net as well. I'm not a big fan of saying I retired and now I'm back. Um, I think you the word retired really stops people and it it indicates to employers in a way that mm, you're maybe not 100 percent in the game and you may not be there for the long run. So you might want to say, you know, you stepped off to sort of refocus, to re-engage, to re-energize, to do some things. And you took, um, you know, a bit of a, you know, a time to do that, but the word retired is really loaded. So I would just be careful about how you use that. And again, during that time that you were quote retired, try to make sure you have some activities that you did that that are that would be engaging for someone to learn about because and we may talk about this in a second but one thing you want to do when you're in if you get in the door for an interview is you want to show your curiosity that's like the best way to fight ageism is to show that you're curious about things and so if you did step away for a little while to kind of take a breath um, you want to show that during that time you didn't just sit sit on the front porch but that you actually were engaged in the world in some way that was creative and that you found uh, filled your curiosity. So let me see which what we, we want to head to next. Um, so in terms you mentioned you mentioned volunteering a few times and we had a question here about how to set boundaries when it comes to offering things that you do for money, you know, skills that you have where you can make money, but offering those skills for free. Oh yeah, that is so difficult. <laughs> I get that one personally. So it's so hard because you want to do pro bono. You want to do good things, but oh my goodness, you do still need to, in my case, you know, I want to make sure my dog stays in kibble or whatever it might be and, you know, have things for myself as well. So you got to draw that line, but it's tricky because once you open that door that you're doing work and the word gets out that you're willing to do work for free, uh, people come and ask you, and it is hard to say no and you have to value your time and so for me and i hope it is for you too i pick those opportunities i draw pretty hard lines about where i do my uh i devote time to pro bono work and um my skills and energy and again it's that list of what and it's not a big list it's a couple of organizations that i find extremely meaningful and make a difference in the world. And I say, you know what? 
they need my help. And, and for me, it's often women, uh, women's organizations or whatever, women and children or animals or those kinds of things. But I only have about three or four that that could get my attention. I, I do a lot of alumni work too with my high school or my college just because I like to reach out to younger people to help them. Um, that's important to me, that mentorship. So, but those are the things, but you have to be very clear. And, and so in your own head, you're not say, I'm really sorry, but I only have so much time to do this, but it's up to you to know in your head who you value. And you can't say yes to everyone or you're going to be exhausted and you're not going to feel uh, valued. Indeed. Uh, question, here's an interesting question. Actually, I'm, I'm, you were talking about trends um, towards the beginning of our time today, and we had a question. Uh, as a 69 year old African American woman, what have you found recently in industry trends of opening up to older people of color? Yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, I, I forget there's some term for that, but you're definitely you've got that. You've got 2 things that you've got to these obstacles to deal with. I think the movement last year made companies more sensitive toward uh, racial uh, equity and those sorts of things uh, and gender equity. Uh, women are getting uh, their, you know, a little more attention. Companies are aware that the, you know, that folks have been sidelined in this way and they're a little more sensitive to that in their hiring practices. But uh, I still see quite a bit of lip service here. So. Again, you know, the, 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 you know, the age old wisdom, it, it's getting back to who do you know at that company that can be your champion? Because no matter what they're saying that they are aware of these practices, you know, we all know, you know, gender pay issues, the huge gap there, the inequities in terms of racial diversity in a workplace and, and they're aware of it, but the problem is the problems are still there. So it's really finding a champion and being able to. Uh, you know, really take advantage of that. Let's talk about something that everybody needs to do these days, and that is resumes. <laughs> so you have a section in your book, Resume Red Flags. And of course, you have a section on what people should do, you know, what people should do with resume. I wanted to ask you, what in your experience has changed with resumes over the last five or 10 years? And what do you see moving forward with resumes? Oh, that is such a good question. Resumes, oh my goodness. I mean, it is, you know, a resume is not what it once was. And you know, I, my favorite thing to say is, you know, okay, let's start right here. Your resume is not your obituary, okay? Your resume is an advertisement. It is a tease. It is the, something that's going to spark somebody's interest and want you to come in and meet them or get on a Zoom call with them or whatever it might be to have this little talk face to face. And it's it's that, you know, it, it's a tease. So you have to be very strategic. Uh, your resume, uh, no one wants to see everything you've done for 20 years. They don't want to know what your quote responsibilities really were at a job. And a job title means practically nothing because job titles have changed. They're, they're quirky ones. They're, you know, they, no one even knows what the job title means in many of these situations. So your resume has to be short. It has to be snappy. It has to be, I like the last 10 years uh, and then do other another box with relevant experience to that specific job. And because the fact of the matter is, even if you're going through a company website with your resume, is probably still going to be scanned for the relevant words in the job description. So these have to be custom made. You don't just send out a generic resume to everybody. I think most of us know this, but you have that that standard one and you plug in the words, the exact words that are in the job posting wherever possible. And um, it's important, I think, in a resume to um, really showcase how you've solved a problem. And I know this is tricky, but what, what career coaches tend to call this your car story, which is your challenge, the action and the result. So when you're listing a position that you worked in, you, you want to have one little detail about what something you did. You brought in a, a job, you know, three months ahead of schedule, or you reduce costs and something, some way that you can hang a number, uh, some value on work you did uh, that will tell a story about who you are. And so those are the little tricks, but it has to be simple, typeface, nothing fancy schmancy, and really clearly um, 
showcase what it is for that particular job. As I said, most employers really want you to be able to hit the run, the, the, the ground running. So it has to be specific to that job. And um, those are the best ways to go about that. Resumes are super um, important still. I mean, I think the LinkedIn profile, depending on the kind of job you're looking for, is better. I, I, I recently, this past year actually, was looking at a full-time position myself, right? Someone asked me if I was interested, they had heard of this posting, I, okay. So, you know, I'm like, oh, just tell them to look at my LinkedIn profile. But in fact, they wanted a resume. <laughs> so I had to do it myself and it was not an easy skate. So I totally get it, uh, how you boil it down for that particular job when you've done lots of other things. So again, you know, really rein it in, be clear, be sharp, and say what is you know what are your stories? Tell a story as best you can. And so piggybacking off of off of that answer, you've mentioned it a few times, and I just want to highlight that you know, and this has come up with a few questions, and that is that you know there are three types of resumes: the functional, the the chronological, and the and the combination. And what it seems like you're recommending is that if people with a ton of experience were relevant experiences at different places in their careers, that's maybe less than or way longer than 10 years ago, is that they use a combination resume. So they put the, the recent job experience in the beginning or and then then have another box that says relevant experience where they may or may not put dates, but put the specific skills that that people have gained over the last uh, over, you know, over their their decades long career is it does that seem about right i absolutely you nailed it that is exactly what people should do in my opinion that's the kind of resume i think that really gives your full scope of who you are but but says hey you know this is what i've been doing most recently but hey uh, this is you know these are my total i like leading with your skills your first foot forward has got to be your skills what are your best skills get those right up on top of your resume. I, I really think that's where you're showcasing your skill set. And then you show the experience most recent, but the relevant one as well. And I'm not a big fan on putting dates on things if you can avoid it. Certainly not education, that sort of thing. People can find that out. I mean, it's not hard to figure out dates on things. Um, they are going to want to know certain years of employment, obviously. But um, and again, uh, this is so basic, but Please, please make sure that you've proofread and proofread and proofread that resume because it is so easy to get mistakes. Read it out loud. Have somebody else read it. Go to Grammarly, I think, is one of a, a, a site you can go to that put your resume up and they can catch things for you. Or um, uh, there's another, there's a, another, um, I'll, I'll try to think of it, another resume site you can send your resume to that they can, you know, really scan it for you um, and take a look at mistakes. But that's what you know people find really turns hiring managers off is having misspellings and or dates that are inconsistent dates on your resume aren't consistent with linkedin so you know make sure you're all on the same page with everything actually um, two things there one in terms of resumes and proofreading have other people look at it because i've i've been in i i write when i'm you know i'm not, I'm not a librarian i'm a writer and so i i know that looking at at something for a long time, you just don't see the little errors. So if you give it to a few other people and they're going to spot them right away because they are looking at something for the first time. And then the other thing is the, the library has a resume review service called BrainFuse. Um, you can get it from our website. You just go there, you can upload your resume. And the, what you'll get is a response from a person and also a response from a computer. And it will be a combination of how to improve the resume. It's a brain fuse. I'll put a, I'll put a link to it in the follow up email. Um, so let's move on to another question. And this is something that also gets asked a lot, and that is about negotiating a salary. We had a question from Janice earlier. She said, I'm curious what you recommend for those of us with decades of experience getting offered salaries well below what we are worth. Do you think there is much room for negotiation in today's environment? God, I hate that. Sorry about that. That is. <laughs> That is like the most uh, egregious thing, and we all are dealing with that, right? I mean, this is this is huge, and it's like you feel right there when you're offered something that isn't even close to what you made in your previous job. It is a situation where you automatically feel not valued. 
you feel that, it, and it's hard to get over that. Yes, uh, a simple answer is yes, negotiation. There is room for negotiation, but where you need to, to be at that is you need to really have done your homework about what that position typically pays at competitors. And uh, even if you have inside scoop at that, at that employer, any, any sort of reconnaissance you can do to have ammunition to say, I, you know, I know that this typically pays X and there are websites that can help you with that. Glassdoor is one, but there are some others. And again, I can send you some uh, off the top of my head. I don't want to just start rattling them off, but you need to have done some homework about what you should, what that position typically would pay. And then I often say, though, if you really want that job, if you really, really uh, think it's a good fit for you, um, this is a chance to let it go a little bit and say, all right, I'm going to, you know, find if there's a way that I can get in the door. And I'm not saying you're going to get your resume up, you know, zip it right up once you get in the door, because it's still once and once you're starting salary is usually you're stuck there for incremental raises. But you might be able to negotiate for can we revisit this in three months or can we revisit in six months for even if it's a bonus or some sort of bump up try to figure out a way let's see how if you can talk to them on that level like you know i you know i feel that you know i'm you know this position would be this but i'm i'm so interested in working for you i'm passionate about what you do is there a way we could revisit this in a few months or are there ways you can find um benefits around the edges that would make up to it for you? Is it more vacation days? Is it more flex time? Which again, I think we're going to see a lot more of anyway. So it's not such a great perk, but are there other perks you might be able to get? Would they maybe pay for some training for you? Things like that, that, that you value that might help make it a little easier for you to accept a position at less than you really uh, feel you deserve. Let's take a little bit of a uh, a turn and talk about interviewing. So in, in your book, uh, 50 plus ways or 50 plus jobs, jobs for those 50 plus, <laughs> for every 50 plus, the book, the book. Whatever. <laughs> um, one, one of the books, the one great job. There it is. And it's in the background. Great jobs for every 50 plus. Uh, uh, you mentioned in the part in tips for phone interviews, having a drink nearby. Yeah. What other tips do you have for people doing phone or video interviews these days? Okay, this is really, you know, because you got to be on, right? You've got to be energized. You've got to be um, focused. Um, there's so many great ways to get yourself prepped. But one way I like to is um, is to laugh. Like make yourself think of something funny and laugh before you start it, so that you kind of relax yourself before the camera goes on or you pick up the telephone your voice you know you just kind of everything relax or smile like try to remember when you're talking whether you're on the phone and they can't see you or you know if you're you know on the computer screen smiling is really great i mean smiling it, people can feel that warmth and that interest through your physical expression so even if they can't see you if you're smiling um, inside, you know, to yourself while you're talking on the phone, it comes through. It really, truly does. And I, you know, there's certain, you know, some tips about, you know, be sure that you've eaten. You know, some people forget to eat because you're nervous or you're, you know, you you're rushing to prepare. But make sure that you've eaten well that morning. Maybe if you've exercised, that you know, you're wearing something that you feel good in. If you're on camera, particularly, do you do you like what you're wearing? Are you comfortable? These are really, you know, su superficial things, but it matters. I like also putting up post-it notes uh, around my computer or around my office of things that I want to remember to say. Um, and so that if it comes down to, you know, some questions, I want to be sure to ask them, uh, the hiring manager, whoever it is, uh, the interviewer. Um, I have those so I don't forget them or they want me, you know, the three selling points I have for myself. I have those on post-it notes, but put those around you as anything you want to be reminded of so that you don't get off and you've forgotten to do those things. And, um, you know, don't get all jazzed up on caffeine. I like a little caffeine if that helps you, but, you know, try to find that you're a sweet spot. Uh, and again, when you're having these kind of interviews, do your homework about who that person is first. So if you can find a way to 
bridge into that conversation by making a personal connection to them, whether it's a hobby that they have, or if you happen to be in a, a Zoom call or this kind of call that we're having with this discussion today, something in the background in their office that might catch your eye, but anything you can do to say, hey, you know, uh, I also, I, you know, have a, I, I myself have been on interviews where I've gone in and someone has a picture of their dog or something. I was like, oh, you have a Labrador retriever. So do I. And, and that's an icebreaker. We all know it's a classic, it's a classic move, but try to do it. And it people instantly relax. And also I try to turn that interview situation around to interviewing them in a way. Yeah, they want to know about you, but truthfully. People want to talk about themselves, as I said before. So try to find out why they work at that company, what they love about their job, what they see the biggest challenges in their industry right now, or for someone who's taking that job. What are the big things? And and that, you know, they'll walk away from that interview thinking, wow, that person is really, you know, engaging because you've engaged them. Uh, Jill in the chat also says, if you've, I've heard that looking in the mirror will help you remember to smile. Oh, good one. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I do. Because it's so true. It's just that smiling gives you energy and, uh, you know, you can't go wrong. You know, <laughs> they, when you're stiff and serious, they, people, yes, they want you to be serious and you're, you know, you're, this is a big business, right? You're looking for a job, but half, I swear, maybe even more than half of getting in a job is whether you're going to fit in at the company, whether they see you as a cultural fit, like that you're going to get along with the other kids. So it's they, it's a likability factor that it's hard it's hard to put your finger on that. But if you can show your personality, that is going to and it gets a two way street too. You look at them and you're like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm not sure that I even want to work with that person. <laughs> so you know, but it, again, it, it's it's really trying to it's it's uh, how you're going to fit in. Now we got a really interesting question here, totally unlike the other questions. Uh, and I don't think I've ever seen a question like this in all of the work ready sessions. So I, I have to ask it. Um, how do you navigate when a potential employer asks to contact previous employers in a situation where it didn't end well? Um, and this is, it's not just somebody you work that this person worked for recently. It's, you know, it's somebody, some, they worked for a decade ago. Hmm. I don't like that one. I mean, that is really, really hard, isn't it? Because if it didn't end well, um, that is, that's tricky. And, you know, the only thing I, I would try to discourage that, right? I mean, I don't think anything good is going to come from that. I mean, truthfully, in any job I've had, I've tried to make sure I never, when I switched jobs, I never burned any bridges and I've kept those networks of old employers and old colleagues close you know I'm, i remember when somebody's birthday or i mean i'm not at, you know crazy about it but i do you make sure i keep those collegial connections so that you do have people at your old place of employment that can say great things about you and you about them as well but in this situation if it, it truly wasn't a good situation you don't want them going back there and i think the best response is i don't see how that's relevant to the position i'm hiring that you're you're hiring me for today that was a long time ago, I was doing different kinds of work and, you know, I would try to soft shoe your way out of that. Yeah, I agree that it, 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 I read the question. I was like, that sounds very awkward. <laughs> I feel sorry for that for that for that person. Yeah, um, so let's talk about and we, we have only a few minutes left and I really want to talk about social media. Okay. Um, and this is something that it, it that can be a challenge for many people uh, because if somebody's not familiar with different social media platforms, it feels like there's so much out there. So the first question is how important is social media when it comes to a job search? And then the second question, the follow-up for that is what platform or platforms should job seekers really focus on? Um, if they, you know, if they have limited time, limited resources to learn, you know, where should they spend their time? Okay, so here is the, the quick answer is that social media is critical in today's world to finding work and why that is. And again, I'm saying I've already said you got to have the personal connection, so on and so forth, but employers are going to do their research on you, right? You're, if they say, hey, she looks pretty interesting. He looks pretty interesting. You've done your research on that company and that job, but they're going to be doing it on you as well. So they're going to do a Google search. They're going to say, see what comes up. So if you don't have any 
presence on social media, that's a red flag because it, it's it, it, in some ways it, it's, uh, it equates to your comfort with technology, which is something employers fear that workers over 50 aren't up to speed with, which we know is not true. But still, uh, you can't be out of step with this. I mean, you have to ha know how to communicate on a social media platform. So, and you need to, to vet it, search your own name, see what comes up because there may be things you don't want. If in fact you have been on Facebook and you have some weird photographs of you doing crazy things, I'm not saying there are, but maybe there are, you want to clean it up. You don't want some of that stuff takes down something extremely, you know, and you, there may be people that have the same name as you who live in the same hometown that have a different reputation than you have and they have things and you need to have an answer to explain that if somebody were to bring that up uh, when, because they're, they're going to be researching you. So that's the bottom line. Please have some kind of comfort level with that. Uh, there's way too much out there to be an expert on all of them. I think social media is great for doing your research on a company. Uh, going to the company website is important, but also following them on LinkedIn, uh, reading about what they post and what that hot person who might be hiring, looking at their profile, uh, searching them, having that interactive ability is important. And so, again, my favorite one for looking for jobs for most uh, white collar jobs, that is, is LinkedIn. I think you cannot go wrong with LinkedIn on some level um, and, and employers look at it. I think Facebook can be a lot of fun and it can be interesting. Now it's again, it, it's your comfort level with Facebook, but I find I've actually found work myself through Facebook through high school friends. <laughs> so again, this is in the networking area. You may find people that you're connected with on a more you know, familiar level, like a Facebook for a lot uh, high school friends or something that may actually lead you to a job. So don't rule that one out. And so don't be afraid uh, to reach out to them in a personal. I wouldn't put post anything about that on Facebook, but you could do a private message to somebody uh, if you know they work in an industry that you're interested in. And why not reconnect that way? So those are good. Twitter is fun to follow for industry trends. Uh, again, it's but you don't need to have an active presence there. I just think it's. As a voyeur, it's interesting to learn more about the company or the people who you might be involved with in a job search. Thanks, Gary. That, that's definitely helpful. So LinkedIn is the one. I think so. You know. LinkedIn is yeah. For I mean, it makes sense because that's the one. That's the one for that most people associated with job seeking and jobs. Yeah. And, and one thing I'd like to add to that when I said LinkedIn. Also, LinkedIn is great for so many things because you can really show your personality, you can show your interests, you can be chatty. I'm not saying, you know, really super, but in the, when you're talking about your summary of yourself, you can use your own voice. You can talk, it's not stiff, it's not boring, it shows your personality. It's a great way to showcase yourself and what inspires you, what, what you're motivated by, um, things you love. And, and so this is a great uh, platform for that. You can put a photo, please put a photo, don't do it without a photo. And it doesn't have to be a great photo, but it should be something representative of, of you, a professional photo. And uh, you don't have to pay a professional photographer. I'm saying you can get a good headshot. Your your friend or one of your family members can do it for you, but, but do have a relatively current one. But the thing, the key thing is up at that summary at the top when you're saying who you are, a lot of people tell you if you're job seeking, you should say you're looking for a job there. I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's a great thing to show that you're um, that you're you're looking. I think it's important to say who you are there. You know, you might put up there, you know, that you're a project manager or you're um, a, a mentor. Do with a vertical slash the things how you identify yourself because when employers recruiters are looking, they're looking for those kinds of generic uh, titles. But so break it down into who you what you're selling rather than that you're looking. And look for people who you admire. Go look at their profiles. That'll give you some ideas. Actually, we did we did a uh, we did a program on um, LinkedIn um, a few sessions ago. Uh, it was Anna Sylvia who did it was basically a beginner's guide to LinkedIn and it's currently on our YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to get started with LinkedIn but isn't sure how, um, the program's about 35 to 45 minutes long and covers just like how to start a profile and where that where that thing that the summary that you're talking about is. 
I think that's um, so great. Please, I encourage anyone on this uh, session to do that because LinkedIn, it, it's not that hard, but it's it's good to have a tutorial and someone to lead you through it. I'll post a link to that in the follow up email that I'm going to send in a little bit. So uh, it's uh, afternoon here, and I know it's after three for you, Carrie. Um, one last question, and this is I was I was going through great jobs for 50 plus, and I saw something that I had never heard of before, and that's reverse mentoring. What's reverse mentoring? Yeah, I mean, hello, you know, everyone thinks, oh, it's, you know, you're so great and experienced and you're going to help this younger colleague or, you know, come along and teach them, you know, the ways of the world. But truthfully, for me, I love turning to somebody younger to help me <laughs> learn the ways of the world. So I have someone who is really uh, like two decades younger than me, who is fabulous with the latest and greatest in technology. And I turn to him and I say, you know what? I'm really stumped by this. Can you just walk me through it? And so he's reverse mentoring me. And so I'm really sensitive to how it's a two way street because, and actually, I think he feels really good about helping me with this stuff. And then I don't have to act like, you know, I'm a, you know, sort of a Luddite when I'm actually working with my client, but I've already done my reconnaissance on the back end and gotten someone to give me a little holding hand. Sometimes it's my nephews and nieces that help me too, but, but reach out around and, and look to people younger than you to, to mentor you because they are really. Uh, on the forefront of some of the changes, things are changing quickly in the workplace. The jobs are changing how we do our jobs. Technology is a big piece of it, but there's so much more. And so I think it's really important to stay nimble. And the best way to do that is to connect with somebody younger. And, and one of the big ways is even in communicating. Like when I work with younger editors, sometimes I get furious because, well, I, now I know not to do this, but because they're not responding to my emails or my phone calls. And it's like, what is wrong with them? And I realized that it's because they wanted me to text them. And I know that sounds really basic, but the minute I started doing that, I started getting responses. So it's, you need to say upfront, if you're working with somebody who's younger than you, a younger boss, particularly, you know, how do you like to communicate? And then make sure maybe you're using your younger mentor to help you learn how to communicate in that fashion, because to them, it's nothing. That makes sense. Yeah, text is hard to ignore because it just comes in and beeps and you have your phone on you already. And you just... Right. Dude, it just takes a second yeah. and, and a phone call can take a long time and nobody wants to waste the time. You know, they're moving on to other things and even an email, they don't check their emails more than a couple. I, I'm not I'm saying they in a broad fashion, but you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, everybody, everybody communicates differently. Yeah. Age, age sometimes has to do with it. So it def definitely makes sense. Something to pay attention to when re when reaching out to people. But when I know we're running short of time, but in interviews, the other thing I want to encourage you is be really careful to catch yourself, not to date yourself in the way you talk about, oh, well, you did something that was, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, or, you know, and or to try to, you find yourself slipping into, you know, sort of almost a professorial uh, giving somebody instructions about something that who's interviewing you. You have to be really careful not to show your age uh, to reflect ageism because sometimes, Ageism is something we bring on ourselves by the comments we make about ourselves and, you know, our time in the workplace, which is something we should be proud of highlighting, not denigrating in any way, nor uh, trying to use that as, um, you know, you need to be current is, is the most important thing. Definitely. Thank you very much, Carrie. This, this, this has been really great. We had a lot of really great questions. And really appreciate you taking the time to give us the answers and giving us give us some of the the trends about what's coming up. Uh, what I want to do is end actually with a little quote from Great Jobs for Everyone 50 Plus. There's something that I that I I, I wrote it down actually because I because I enjoyed it. Um, and you're talking about it it's that it's it's not easy to get a job for the folks 50 plus, but landing a job after 50 does take research, soul searching, and swagger. Um, I really like that. Research, <laughs> soul searching, and swagger. Yeah. So if, if, if all the people out there can just get those things, then I, I think it'll make <laughs> getting a job a little bit easier. I agree. I agree. Thanks for pulling that one. <laughs> all right. With that,
I say once again, thank you everyone out there for joining us today. Thank you, Carrie, for your excellent presentation and extremely useful information. Good afternoon, good luck, <laughs> and goodbye. Bye all, thank you.